Thanks for tuning into Talking Point. I'm your host, Neeraj Shah. And on a day when the markets are kind of following up from where they left off on Friday, it's a great moment to get in. Ashwini Agarwal, founder of Demeter Advisors, uh, with his thoughts on what to do in a scenario like this. As we speak, by the way, some very positive commentary from Larson and Tubro on your screen as well. But Ashwini, great having you. Thanks for taking the time out. Always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, Morning, we, we, are, we are circa 25,000, Ashwini. Uh, I've asked this question every single thousand point, where do we go from here? I really had to ask, where do we go from here after such a momentous landmark about to be reached? Well, um, Neeraj, obviously, um, you know, for many of us uh, who've been looking at valuations uh, as yeah. a guidepost, uh, we've all been surprised uh, by, by the strength in the market. And I think uh, the, the, the part that we underestimated is the power of flows. Um, I mean, the if you just look at the trend and uh, the the amount of, of retail money that's flowing into the markets uh, is simply too large, uh, and that continues. Uh, I was doing some calculation, and if you assume that Indian household savings are somewhere in the ballpark of 18, 19 percent of GDP, uh, and fiscal 25 will be you know a year when we should cross four trillion dollars in GDP numbers. Uh, you're talking about something like $750 billion, give or take, of household financial savings. Household savings. Out of this, uh, financial savings are roughly, you know, they range between 55 to 60%, pick a number. And if you include uh, what indirectly comes into the markets uh, via insurance, via uh, PPA, uh, via, via NPS, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, my estimate is that at least about 10% uh, of this financial savings pool uh, comes into the equity market incrementally each year, which is you know, 70 to $80 billion. Against this, the supply of paper in the first quarter was about $12 billion. So you multiply that by four, you get to about $50 billion. So you still have $20 billion of incremental inflow from domestic savers. So, Unless the supply becomes significantly larger over the next uh, uh, over, over the next three quarters or so, my sense is that the momentum that you're seeing in the market will continue. Having said this, we are already starting to see the scale of flows increase. I mean, you have the Hyundai IPO coming up soon, which is going to be a pretty large offering. You got Ola, uh, which is again a pretty large offering. So. So a lot of these flows are now getting to be of significant scale and size. So let, let's see, it's interesting. Uh, let's see whether the flows will underwhelm uh, the retail investor or the other way around. Uh, and, and the FII, we haven't spoken about that at all. In some sense, Ashwini, the promoters and the companies with sold stakes, in some sense, did a favor to the markets, right? Because the flows have been very strong. There was not as much supply of paper, maybe. And therefore, there was supply to help absorb the kind of demand that is there. But, but the question is this, Ashwini. I mean, mm -hmm. we, I speak to multiple FIs who say that valuations selectively are a concern in India relative to other EMs, waiting for a dip. Maybe these dips get bought into because aside of the new flows that are coming in, I was doing some math. The mutual funds, mutual fund community is sitting on circa lakh crores worth of deployable cash and cash equivalents, which is also a very large sum. So if a dip comes in, that money at some point of time will come into the markets. That's true, Neeraj. Uh, but also remember that, uh, you know, the inflows that have come into mutual funds over the last six months or so, I'm sure the mutual fund managers are also thinking about what happens when the tide turns and what happens if the inflows turn into outflows. Now, why that happens, we don't know. And when it will happen, also we will not know. So if you again look back at the two big bull markets that I've seen in my life, uh, one is 99-2000, the, the TMT bubble, as we uh, fondly used to call it back in the day, or you look at the 2007-2008 cycle, uh, which was a very strong bull run uh, followed by the global financial crisis. In both these times, uh, while the flows peaked uh, ahead of uh, the market peaking, uh, there were significant outflows thereafter. So, so yes, you're right. The uh, mutual fund industry is sitting on a significant amount of cash. They continue uh, to hoover up a lot of cash. 
a lot of the schemes where uh, fund managers had actually closed the schemes for new inflows have been reopened is what I'm told. Uh, so I think uh, they kind of, uh, you know, said, well, you know, we are in the business of uh, asset accumulation. So let's accumulate the assets while we can. Uh, so I, I think I think that 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 is continuing and you're right. They're sitting on a lot of cash. So every little dip will be getting bought into but i think the the overall valuations are now getting to a point where uh you know i'm sure everybody who has a lot of money and is has been around for a while is scratching their heads to see okay where do i deploy this where my drawdown will be the least that's true so ashwini uh, mutual fund managers and even private investors or family offices like yours are also in the business of accumulating assets let's put it that way so where does yeah. somebody who is, by the way, you've got a holiday tan, I must say. So that is great news. But where, where, where does somebody who uh, sees valuations as a bit of a discomfort put in money to work at the current juncture? Or are you, are you comfortably sitting on the sidelines waiting for a crash to come in? Okay. So Neeraj, when I think about asset allocation and when I think about stock selection, so those are the two ways one manages uh, the probability of a significant uh, drawdown. Okay. So let's again go back to 19 and 2000 and 2007, eight for some clues. If you go back to 19 and 2000 and you see that at that point in time, the valuations for consumer stocks, pharmaceuticals, technology, media were very elevated. But the old economy stocks, including the banks, uh, several PSU banks, cement stocks or manufacturing stocks, LNP, BHEL, all of these were trading at throwaway valuations, even at the peak of the bull market. And if you just moved away from the near-term momentum and invested away from the sectors that were expensive or hot and looked out three or four years uh, out, you made a tremendous amount of money. It's not that these stocks didn't give you losses in the sell down during 2001, they did, but they didn't fall as much as the TMT stocks did. Similarly, in 2007, 2008, if you had bought a consumer stock or a pharmaceutical stock or an IT services name, uh, they would have again fallen during the global financial crisis, but they fell by a much less order as compared to the real estate stocks or infrastructure stocks or uh, you know the other names including the PSU names that declined precipitously post the GFC. The point that I'm making is that you can seek safety by looking at good businesses that have underperformed over the last three to four years. Um, so in that context, uh, I think you know markets have been kind of looking at insurance names, looking at consumer staples names, uh, looking at even IT in uh, the recent weeks and months. Um, and, and these are probably the areas where you will lose less as compared to a broader market. So that's that's one part of the puzzle. Uh, when I think about uh, risk management, I also look at overall exposure to equity, which in my personal view should be a band uh, which is based on uh, you know your age, your risk profile, uh, you know uh, your risk tolerance, uh, et cetera, et cetera, any expected returns, of course, from your financial pool. Um, and that for me personally, for example, ranges from X percentage to X percent. I'll be at the lower end of the band when I'm uncomfortable and I'll be at the upper end of the band when I'm very comfortable with valuation. So as markets go up, you keep drifting down on the asset allocation towards equities. That's the only thing you can do. So you can't be but completely Ashwini, out of equities and sitting on a lot of cash. Yeah. No, Ashwini, but yeah. I'm tempted to ask you, you are not a mutual fund. You don't have yeah. the uh, pressure of beating the benchmark. What are you doing currently? You don't have yeah. to buy an IT name uh, because you want to fall less, right? You can comfortably sit on cash. Are you buying into IT currently, for example? So I'm not buying into IT in specific, uh, but yes, I am I am invested, right? I, I don't want to go below a certain percentage in equities because I could okay. be wrong. Okay. I could be wrong that the market uh, you know, will be correct. <laughs> so at the end of the day, asset allocation also has to have boundaries. A minima and a maxima, right? Right. It has right, to right. apply to equity, so, it has to apply to fixed income, everything. Got it. So within that minima, you are saying you yes. so within that thing, you have some exposure to IT and this thing because you believe that if the markets would correct, your portfolio might correct less, even though you have lesser exposure to equities, I presume, than what you normally would have. 
you are absolutely right so uh, insurance consumer staples uh, some of the places where Got it. Uh, you know i'm comfortable that you know i'm willing to hang on for the next 3 or 4 years and see a a big sell off if it were to occur especially in the small and mid space so i'm not completely out of small and mid stocks i think i think on a bottom up basis one continues to see a yeah. lot of interesting opportunities so you know there the only thing that you can do is you say okay you know what i'm going to hold this um, you know for the next 5 years come, uh, come what may yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah and and that's how you look at it so 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 that's why i'm saying that there are two layers yeah, yeah. right so yeah. there, there is an asset allocation layer and then there is a stock selection layer makes complete sense okay that's how you manage this uh, thank you uh, very very good lessons um one one question on the here and now there seems yeah. to be a bit of a spurt in activity and in performance for bfsi i mean yeah for a shriram finance to get rewarded the way it did today is a bandhan bank icici bank etc all of them revving up uh, financials have been quiet for the first 6 months of the current calendar could the next 6 months belong to them is possible um, but if you look at the results that have been reported for the june quarter thus far uh results from the banks have been a clearly a mixed bag okay uh there is pressure on cost of funds there is pressure on liquidity and there are signs that the asset i think we've just lost it has started to from decadal lows hello can you hear me Yeah, sorry, just lost that for a bit. But you were Ashwini, where I lost you, you were just mentioning about how there is a cost of pressure on funds, or, or the pressure on cost of funds. Sorry, and then we lost you a bit. Okay, I think we've lost that feed a little bit. Uh, connectivity issues out there uh, on 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 the internet. Uh, we'll try and get uh, Ashwini Agarwal back in moments from now. As we speak, though, I just want to mark that IT is under pressure and banks are the one which are doing well. the reason why i asked about banks just look at the way financials are performing the last two or three sessions for a bandhan bank or a shriram finance to get the kind of response that they did uh, shriram finance up 10% on friday bandhan bank up 10% today shriram has cooled off a little bit from the highs of the day but still can't take away the 9% up move that we had in friday session so very strong performance uh, from that uh, that end and by the way small caps are not doing too bad okay but let me dial back to ashwini agarwal i think we've gotten him Ashwini, I would urge you to maybe start from the beginning. Uh, you were talking yeah. about some concerns around the results of the banking names. Yeah, what I was saying was that the results of banks have been a mixed bag. Okay, where you are starting to see pressure on liquidity, starting to see pressure on uh, the uh, deposit growth, and at the margin, credit costs have started to turn up. So in that environment, um, you know, while banks have underperformed and valuations are quite reasonable. um you know i i i don't know where is the ammunition for the banks to fire so strongly so obviously bandhan uh, which you mentioned and uh, because i'm naming a stock just to clarify i don't have any position in the name uh, that stock has is 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 doing well post uh, you know pretty solid numbers over the weekend uh, my sense is that it's going to be a very stock specific journey and again banks fall into that bucket of uh, businesses or stocks which have massively underperformed over the last uh, uh, last uh, you know 6 months or one year so from a downside protection perspective you probably have a lot of downside protection in the banks and financials which is why they are revving up okay ashwini um, one final question uh, you yes. mentioned that bottom up you might be um, active uh, where is it that you have the highest conviction sectorally you have some investments in real estate names maybe some infra names you had spoken about energy in the past with me where is it that you still have the highest conviction i don't think it's very sector specific when i'm looking bottom up i think it's very stock specific um, so there are stocks in the consumer area there are stocks in healthcare pharmaceuticals uh, there are stocks as you mentioned uh, in real estate I mean, I think these are very bottom-up opportunities. See, what I'm doing, uh, just to again give you a framework rather than a name, is that I'm saying that look, is there a business out there uh, which doesn't have uh, a lot of balance sheet risk? It doesn't have uh, a lot of uh, uh, business risk in the sense that there is fair amount of visibility on how the business will do over the next five years, 
and are valuations trading broadly around a median of a long term history if that's the case then i'm willing to buy it and hold on to it it's very difficult today to find stocks which are trading below long term median uh, so i'm i'm it's futile even looking in that direction almost uh, so i'm looking at sort of reasonable valuations very cheap valuations are not possible anymore and i'm looking for uh, businesses which are well managed with not too much of balance sheet risk uh, where i can see reasonable growth over a five year time frame and there i'm saying okay fine i'll i'll hold on and i'll i'll stay in here for the next five years it's possible i lose 20 30 40% if the market were to have a very aggressive sell off but i'm willing to look through that and one essential feature is that many of these stocks have probably underperformed in the last 4 to 5 years okay i think i've lost ashwini agarwal again uh, okay no we do have him okay fine i just thought sorry i thought i was looking at a, 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 a static a frame screen. but okay but ashwini i get your point so stay bottom up be mindful of the valuations look at the minima and maxima and within the investments as well try and brace for a portfolio strategy which may uh, fall less in the event of a market correction at least that's the mantra that ashwini agarwal is following for the time being Ashwini, so good talking to you today. Thanks for taking the time thank out and giving did. us that framework. Sometimes this is a lot more important than having a name, to be very honest. So thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now the pleasure was ours. Time for a quick break, viewers. We'll be right back.